and then recording started. Wonderful. Um, and then Meg, I believe, is going to be um, up. One second. Can you hear? Okay, we're good. Okay, so. Okay, so Jenna will be introducing the panel right now. Um, and so we are so excited uh, on behalf of the Tufts Middle East Research Group to have Mohammed, Karim, and Nishad here for this exciting panel. I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Jenna, and she will introduce um, this exciting event. Hi. Okay, thank you so much for being here. First of all, I'll begin the introduction to the event right now. So hello everyone and welcome to our panel on climate and climate change in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm just gonna readjust up here a little bit. Today we will be discussing topics such as the effects of COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference on the region. The pressures that countries and groups are facing relating to climate and environmental issues and to the ways that activists in the region have stepped up to, to combat the crisis, such as all of you three. We have three wonderful speaking speakers with us today with expertise and a long history of work in the region that we are excited to welcome. Nishad Shafi is a climate advocate, energy and policy expert on the Middle East. He was a dis distinguished as one of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy 2019 by Apolitical. Nishad's work involves grassroots awareness policy and research to advocate for laws and policies that create lasting environmental change at multiple scales from national to local. Karim El Gendi is an urban practitioner and sustainability consultant based in London with 20 years of experience. His current work focuses on developing sustainable and resilient cities, urban developments, and buildings in the Middle East and North Africa. But his experience spans Europe, North America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Karim is the founder and coordinator of Carbon, an advocacy initiative promoting sustainability in cities of the Middle East and North Africa through research and communication. Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud is the director of climate and water of the climate and water program at the Middle East Institute. His areas of expertise include climate change adaptation, water policy analysis, and scenario planning. He has previously been a senior policy analyst at the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, where he provided research, modeling, and analysis on interstate Colorado River Basin programs and binational water issues between the United States and Mexico. He is also a faculty associate at the Arizona State University. Thank you all so much for joining us. I will now pass off to our moderator for today's panel, Carolina Hidalgo Macabe, a junior studying international relations and civic studies, who is co-president of the Middle East Research Group. Thank you so much, Jenna, for that introduction and for being with us today. Um, we're so excited to have this panel and welcome all who are joining on Zoom and in person in Cabot 206. We're so excited that you took the time out of your busy afternoons um, to make time for this exciting event this evening. If anyone in the audience has questions at any point, feel free to submit them via the Q&A feature on Zoom. And you can also text message them to Meg in person in Cabot 206. Uh, we will get to them in the latter half of the event. Um, I just wanna open up this panel, starting off with each of you taking two to three minutes to introduce yourself a little bit more than those bios and your work. And we'll start with you, Nishab. Uh, thank you, I'm the most genuine, I, pro I probably believe that. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so I'm Nishab, I'm based here in Doha in Qatar. So I've been working with uh, more on the youth advocacy uh, since I uh, co-founded Arab Youth Climate Home in Qatar in 2015, which was a youth club back then, which was, I was a fresh graduate back then too. And then in 2018, we became um, a registered environmental association, first of its kind, which is independent non-governmental organization here in the state of Qatar. 
So I did a work on uh, youth advocacy. And uh, um, since 2015, I've also had the opportunity to attend the COPS. So I've been actively engaging young people from the region and the role of young people in climate advocacy awareness and also policy development. So a lot of work on capacity building for young people within the region and um, COP coming back to the region again in 2022 and 2023 would be in the Middle East and North Africa region. So what are stakes for the young people in the region? This is the work we've been doing. Now it's the time to ask the showcase. So that's what I've been doing. and. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Professionally, I'm a design engineer working in water industry. Uh, also recently joining another organization as a sustainability client, carbon expert too. Thank you so much, Nishad. We can go to you, Mohammed, next. Sure, thank you, Carolina. So uh, my name is Mohammed Mahmoud and uh, uh, somewhat newly minted, I mean, it's been a few months, but director of the Climate and Water Program uh, at the Middle East Institute. Uh, you know, a lot of my work and background is focused uh, primarily on the nexus of uh, climate change and water resources, uh, amongst other sort of drawing impacts from climate change. But a lot of my work is looking at, well, how do we how do we expand adaptation as it relates to climate change impacts, primarily in natural resources and environment and, and most more so uh, water resources and how it's utilized uh, to meet demand both uh, and the municipal way for populations and residents, as well as agricultural use and, uh, and industry. Um, so a lot of my focus is more on the technical aspects as it relates to climate change, as it relates to adaptation uh, and to a lesser degree mitigation. So I'll leave it at that so we can have more, more time for discussion later. Yes, thank you so much, Mohammed. And we'll go to you, Karim. Thank you. So um, like Mohammed, I'm also rather technical. Um, my name is Karim El Gendi. And I, I as I say, I, um, I'm rather technical by background. I focus most of my uh, consulting work, which you alluded to in the biography, um, on cities and urban developments, uh, mostly large scale developments um, in, mid in the Middle East and, and in Africa in general. Uh, um, but I also had this advocacy hat through Carbon, which I founded in 2009, uh, the time I was back in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was quite uh, excited about sustainability uh, in the MENA region. Um, I focused specifically most of much of our research and advocacy work and, and communication work uh, on, on, on the cities. Um, and, and recently have become more of a researcher because of all of the work that we've been doing for Carbone uh, for the last 12 years or so. Uh, so I've uh, joined Chatham House as an, as an associate fellow and I've also joined uh, Mohammed uh, on the Middle East Institute as a non-resident scholar. Uh, so that kind of gives me a, a hat that is more on the research expert side, focusing uh, on um, climate change adaptation and mitigation, but not exclusively on cities. It, it, I do a lot of work on um, uh, on national national climate policies as well, um, uh, like Nishad, I go to all the all the, the conferences of parties, for, uh, including the last one here in Glasgow, and uh, and that uh, exposes us quite a bit to, um, to to the wider climate policy issues and helps us implement um, our work, be that research, advocacy, or consultancy, uh, in a way that is more grounded. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And that's a great note to end on because our first question to open up to whoever wants to start speaking first is, I was hoping each of you could let us know a little bit about what some of the biggest and most significant outcomes of the COP26 summit were impacting the MENA region specifically. Um, so any of you can start off first. You'll have to ask people. You'll have to ask people. You can't do that. Yeah. Then I'll ask them. Go I, for I it. Would defer to, I would defer to Kareem because he was actually there. Okay. okay. Uh, well, the COP means a lot of things for the world. Uh, it's not a regional event, but it does have impacts on the region. We have seen a few things happen in the COP uh, that relate to the region. We have seen uh, obviously, the COP moving to the region uh, in the next two COPs, and that was a big deal. Um, it was widely uh, discussed and what would that mean and what kind of COPs are we going to get uh, in terms of the focus. Um, there are already clues as to what Charm, um, the COP in Charm and the COP27 would look like and what the Abu Dhabi 
COP would look like as well. Um, and they are different in terms of their focus. They probably will end up being more um, adaptation in the case of in the case of Charm and more about solutions in the case of Abu Dhabi uh, rather than decarbonization and the push to increase ambitions to cut carbon emissions what we saw here uh, in Glasgow. Um, these are very, very broad strokes. So, so forgive me for this. Um, we had uh, also seen the emergence of some increased ambitions on climate action in the MENA region just before the COP. Uh, so that everyone ramped up their ambition, partly because they were encouraged to do so uh, by the ratchet mechanism from the Paris Agreement that every country needs to update its NDC. There are the pledges for the Paris Agreement uh, in a way that is more stringent, more demanding than the one that they submitted five years ago. Um, but there was a clause to allow countries to do it every 10 years as well. So a lot of countries didn't um, from the region, I mean. Uh, so those who did have increased their ambitions quite significantly. And we have seen several uh, zero carbon um, pledges again before, before the COP. Um, these are not required necessarily by the Paris Agreement, but they, were, they indicate a certain change in direction. Uh, from some countries that have seen the opportunity to transition to uh, to a, a low carbon economy, uh, even if the Paris Agreement does not necessarily require them uh, to do this. But the ambitions in general, in terms of the pledges, have been going up, um, albeit uh, maybe modestly. Um, and then, um, so so these are sort of the the bigger the bigger the bigger trends. And then there was the big idea that happened, a uh, regional idea that happened um, just before the COP when Saudi Arabia announced the Middle East. Uh, green initiative, which is a sort of an, a, the first attempt at regional collaboration, and we have not seen anything like this. At least, nothing that was called the Middle East Green anything. Um, so that was that was quite encouraging, and the emergence of this new idea, the carbon uh, circular carbon economy, which is proposed by Saudi Arabia, and it's almost a new framing of how climate should be um, managed, how the climate issue should be addressed. Uh, that is different from the current one that is on the table at, at COPs and every other uh, climate forum. So Saudi Arabia basically proposed a new way, and not just for itself, but for the world. So I think I think these are the big the big items I think that come to mind in terms of um, in terms of COP twenty six. Thank you so much, and we'll go to you, Nishad, for a little bit of your insight on the COP twenty six. Outcomes. Well, I, I would I would jump into more um, on a youth perspective. Uh, what what gained and what is up to the COP27 and COP28 in the region? Uh, not much. Where um, um, part of the COP26, the inclusivity was the main part. Uh, uh, much of the young people weren't able to. Of course, with the COVID restriction, there were a lot of um, confusion, and of course, some of the countries where vaccination wasn't uh, um, um, prone, so they were not able to travel and. Um, provided uh, you know, sufficient funding to um, Global South to participate in general, uh, the number was still the same old number. And uh, again, from the Global South, it was again, we see the young people from the Global North looks like they're gonna save the world, but uh, absolutely no. And now the whole COP is coming to the region. So the, the things that the, the whole um, modus operandi would change. We wouldn't see greater marching in Cairo uh, or uh, in Abu Dhabi uh, and those sort of, um, you know, um, what is so well-known climate ag and action from the, you know, Fridays for Future or other young activists from the global north who are very prone to marches and parliament marches. Uh, how would they uh, fit into the context of the Middle East or, uh, system? Uh, the, you know, this, uh, these are either authoritarian or a half democratic system. So how do they fit into this sort of um, advocacy? But yes, in the past region re did ho host COP here in Doha in 2012, which is called COP18. And in in Turkey, I believe in the past also hosted, but there wasn't sort of this advocacy and young people marching in the street calling for actions were in the common in the past, but now it has been a very household thing. Now the climate change is not more political anymore. Young people take us like a part of their own. And this has been changed how youth movements have been seen in the Gulf region or in the Middle East as such. Um, more like uh, towards North Africa, you see more marches and young people are demanding for more actions. There are a lot of uh, social entrepreneurs and social activists coming up uh, very uh, profoundly on social media or in other media channels. Uh, this would be going high and it's a great time for the leadership for young people from the region to showcase what they have been doing and how they can collectively work with. Now, I wouldn't say Global South also is not going to save the world, but now it is time to showcase what is at stake for them, which are always goes 
under the media light. You only see a few on the top of the media and a lot of the actions what young people does on the ground. It is the right time for them to showcase and um, it would be a challenging task for the young people from the region. But I think this is a good timing for, for those summits to come to this part of the world as a part of the, the UN cycle process. Right? It comes to now Africa and then goes to Asia, which goes to now UAE because of the Asia one. So um, there are a lot of stakes for young people. Uh, I would I would love uh, I would love to say uh, Mohammed, this is something I'm actually writing uh, in the coming days. What did it look like for young people for uh, from the MENA region? How COP26 and all the March, Greater Thunberg asking people to come on street. How does that put into context in the Middle East perspective and what young people can showcase to the West that it's not necessary to be on the street to make sure demands are heard at the highest level. There are more than other ways to do that, which we have been doing. For example, through Arab Youth Climate Movement, Qatar, we have been trying to do in a way, I wouldn't be say we're successful. We tried in a way more of a diplomatic approach where we, we were in fighting with or, or putting ourselves in um, streets to make our governments heard, but in more diplomatic approach where we've been approaching the government and how we can have a seat in those discussion. We were like, you know, if you ask some of the countries in the global north, where they're um, asked for being on the part of the uh, national discussion for climate action or climate agenda, where they're part of they said, no, we are working on with them. But I would say we were part of the national NDC discussion here in the state of Qatar, because our work, that's how we work with the government here, more like, um, diplomacy and how youth agenda can be part of the discussion. So we were fortunate to be invited as a stakeholder during the Qatar's NDC discussion. So it looks like it's a great time to showcase how things work in our part, because I still remember the fresh memory because I wouldn't be, uh, attended the summit this year, but I was fresh out of the Youth Climate Summit uh, in Milan, where ahead of uh, the COP26, where young people are still asking why you're in the hosting uh, Fridays for Future in Qatar or UAE, but unlikely, uh, of, of course, of their ignorance, they didn't know how the system works now part of the world. So this is the appropriate time to showcase them how system works and how our young people, with, with, you, know, with, you know, I should say the box, trying to do our best to make sure our voices are heard. So yeah, I am hopeful. And I think it's a huge leadership for the young people in the MENA region. And I think they will deliver. Thank you so much, Nisat Shad. And we'll definitely get to talking more about the role of young people later as well. And I'll pass it off to you, Mohammed, um, to give some final notes on COP26 and its impacts on the MENA region. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really have anything more substantive to add than, than what Nishad and Kareem said, but just from a high level perspective, my perspective, you know, you could almost argue that um, even though there was a mad dash at the end of the conference in terms of putting something together that ultimately looked like became the Glasgow Pact, um, I think what Kareem had, had initially mentioned, I think there was more uh, activity leading up to the meeting than at the meeting itself in terms of substantial uh, commitments or, uh, or intentions uh, to address some of the issues associated with climate change, right? All the, all the in advance uh, proclamations of carbon reductions and the different activities, the green circular economy um, and, and those types of things. Uh, because when you look at the Glasgow Pact itself, it, to me, it seems more like we're kicking the can down the road. Um, you know, there was this dispute at the very end with India pushing back on some of the language and so forth. So when you kind of peel it back, it just looks a lot more like it's a, you know, we will do, we'll continue to do our best uh, type of deal. So it, 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 to me, it wasn't as impactful as what people had uh, or nations had forecasted ahead of the meeting itself um, as, as their intentions uh, to do. But I think one, one item that I feel um, it deserves some recognition in terms of, of finally getting a spotlight it deserves and, and uh, I think Kareem mentioned this as well which is adaptation um, you know we're seeing some more of that adaptation work getting it's been happening in the Middle East but you know the emphasis has always been on mitigation and reducing carbon emissions and, and to me that generally is a, a top-down approach usually it's the nations and governments that really kind of push that initiative or that effort forward uh, but adaptation occurs at virtually any level uh, below that. And so uh, seeing that being recognized uh, was a positive thing. Thank you so much. And I appreciate all of your responses. Um, 
Zooming out a little bit, when we think about climate change impacting the MENA region, how do you all believe that climate change is impacting the MENA region in ways that are different than other regions around the world? We see how activists in the MENA region, as Nishad mentioned, are addressing it in different ways, but in what ways is it disproportionately impacting or impacting differently? And we can start with Karim for this question. Uh, okay, this is an easy question. Uh, so the climate change, you mean the basic impacts, the, the fundamental yeah. impacts? Oh, so we know all of this. So uh, according to the climate models, it will get warmer, uh, maybe two degrees, maybe four degrees in the worst case scenario. Uh, that's average temperature, maximum temperature could go up by seven degrees. Precipitation will go down maybe by 25 degree percent in the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe by 40% in Morocco. Uh, again, worst case scenario, um, weather will become more variable, rainfall will become more intermittent, more floods, more drought uh, at the same time. So the crops might fail as a result because the rain is, not, is, is less predictable. We expect sea level rise, which could be anywhere between a meter and two meters, which will affect the Nile, the Nile Delta, will affect the Southern Iraq, and potentially some of the littoral um, cities on this um, and the Gulf cit uh, cities on the southern littoral of the Gulf. Um, we expect an increase in the wet bulb temperature um, to uh, dangerous, some say fatal levels around the Gulf uh, on both sides of the Gulf, which will affect summer temperature, maximum summer, summer temperatures. And those who work outside um, could create some fatal conditions and some significant uh, research on that as well. So these are the basic. Uh, things. Uh, the, the Eastern Mediterranean is expected to get warmer and, and East and Southern Mediterranean, so the Levant and North Africa, expected to get warmer more than the global average, maybe 20% as much as the global average. So if you know that the temperatures globally is increased by one degree, the those regions have increased by 1.2%, 1 to 2 degrees. Uh, so 20% more, but that doesn't that doesn't mean we fall off our chairs or anything like that, because the, the Arctic is warming at a much faster rate. So it's one of the hot spots, but it's not the hot spot. Um, but the idea that it's more than the global average is in itself bad enough because the region is not, uh, region is disproportionately affected. And the effects of climate change, all the effects I've just listed, the basic effects are more than the region's um, uh, portion or, or share of the global economy. They're more than the region's share of the global uh, population and they're far more than the region's own responsibility for climate change so in a way it's a bit uh, it's a bit unfair shall we say that the, the, the those this part of the world will be affected more than it has contributed to the problem in the first place um, there are secondary and tertiary impacts but i don't want to say everything so i'll leave it to nisha and Mohammed to talk a little bit about this yeah I'll pa thank you so much karim for giving that overview for a lot of the viewers um nishad let's go to you what um other than what Karim has already contributed, what else are some of the biggest impacts of climate change on the MENA region? Well, I mean, uh, Karim put uh, most of all the um, primary, secondary, and tertiary effects as such. Um, uh, temperature rise is something very closely discussed, and uh, also the water water scarcity, given given the fact most of the Gulf region are um, depending on desalination as a whole sole source of uh, drinking water uh, system in this part of the world. And uh, as you know, 70% of the desalination comes from the region as such. So uh, the long lasting desalination has long term effect on the marine ecosystem, not much well studied or documented. Again, in terms of um, um, the climate impacts at a very local level has been not been very well documented or studied at, of course, of many Again, that comes with the political answers because of political issues that haven't been showcased what exactly the effects in Qatar would be looked like in 50 years of time. No, we don't have data. We have spectral data telling that Middle East will be inhabitable in 50 years time. But which part of Middle East? It's a huge region. So the biofasification of all these regions have been collectively told to be like what um, uh, what Kari mentioned, will have uh, um, divided but similar impacts at the same time. Um, given the fact um, how region is a cop up, um, uh, it, it will be a difficult question to answer at this point of time. But given the fact uh, um, the region has been always put in a negative or victimized, uh, uh, that we are the countries in the region who's causing the bad. So the bad people are all in this part of the world. And uh, the, even the COP outcomes, you always see the big brother Saudi Arabia in all the negative news. So uh, so th this has been an unfairly, you know, sometimes showcased. 
Of course, uh, you need to understand the, 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 the system, how the economic system works in this part of the world and how that has to do with uh, development and uh, the people who live in this part of the world. So in terms of the climate impacts, it, it, it's gonna get severe. Uh, the region within the Gulf, which is even though people might say, hey, we have the least uh, uh, rain or uh, rainfall towards the year. Flooding is now getting common. Oman, one of the countries in the Gulf, recently had a huge flooding uh, from uh, flash, uh, what do you call flash flooding of the flash rains falls. So this is a, what do you call the extreme weather events, which we've been talked about, uh, because in the past, uh, for young people, we used to struggle in the past, how, how can you show, how can you uh, tell that the climate change has been personalized way? And people used to still talk about um, the penguins uh, in the Arctic and talk about uh, the forest fires in California, flooding in Bangladesh. And now we are seeing everything on a day-to-day -day basis. Oman is getting flooded. There was a flash flood in Doha in 2017 or 18, I believe due to a rain which they received in two days, supposed to be the rain for six years. So this has been getting common and people are starting to realize that you don't have to refer to now forest fire in California. We just had a huge fire in Lebanon and Turkey very recently. So you don't have to you know, go to the Western or Asian countries to say, hey, it's happening there. We should mind about climate. No, the climate changes have been now very, very uh, visible in the day-to-day -day system in the region. So that has given a more public understanding that uh, Okay, now it's getting serious. Uh, it's not just the uh, uh, rest of the world. We are also part of the rest of the world and we also have been impacted. Uh, among the young people, this has been quite um, um, challenging thing because it, they have been always read as the, what are the impacts of climate change, forest fire, this, and the countries they always refer is California or some of the South Asian underdeveloped countries and who are not able to cope up with the climate impacts. Now, even with all this infrastructure in the rich Gulf or uh, least in, towards the Maghrib or Mashrik regions in the Middle East, all face a similar thing, even the advanced country fail. So just to give an example of, uh, uh, if you say how big difference between infrastructure in the Gulf towards uh, Jordan or Lebanon, which much not much infrastructure as such, developed infrastructure, with all this billion dollar uh, infrastructure, when there was the huge rainfall in Qatar in 2018, I believe, uh, almost all the multi-billion infrastructure was leaking. So to the fact that uh, some of the country's uh, contractors were put on hold that they cannot travel out of the country until they fix it. Most of them answered that our infrastructure was not looking into the rainfall because they don't get rain as such it was received. So after that, I, that is what I understand by the local authority made it that extreme weather or rainfall and snow and other things has to be considered in the coming construction phases. So almost the billion dollar airport was leaking, billion dollar uh, malls were leaking and people were like, what did you do wrong? Because you paid so much money to all this consultant to do all this work. And what is what is, what is this thing? I mean, the country is in limelight because as you know, we are hosting the World Cup next year here in Doha. And almost all the media is looking at Qatar and all the buildings have been leaked because of a very unusual rain we received. And um, well, that was a good wake up call for the leaders here. And now we didn't receive rain for two years. So no rain, uh, we, we hit our, what we call our apparently our winter, which tells us now the temperature is almost 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. That's like our coldest winters. So seemingly this has been changing. So people are observing that we didn't receive rain. And also the winter, what we call supposed to actually comes in September, uh, October, mostly October end. We just received like a week back, the real cold people started wearing so-called our sweatshirts here in the part of the world. But you see that the, the things have been changing in a fast pace and people are realizing, okay, now this is not something in California, it's happening in all my country. And you can correlate with if you ask the people who have been living here. So yeah, this are, I'm just personalizing the issues that are in patch of climate change at the very local level. Thank you so much, Nishad. And I'll pass it to you, Mohammed. No, it's tough being last because they, they get to say all the good stuff first. But <laughs> I will I will add, uh, you know, just to extrapolate uh, on both points that Nishad and Kareem made. We do know we have very good, accurate information, projections on not just obviously the current impacts, but what how we see these impacts changing into the future. You know, I draw, uh, I reference the um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, their sixth assessment report on the physical science that came out in August that looked at the projections of warming, various changes in warming, two degrees, four degrees, et cetera, and how that affects different distinct regions or sub-regions in the world. And all everything uh, that my colleague said is true. One of the things that I find interesting is how these changes affect these different sub-regions that are relevant to the Middle East. Um, and then extrapolating 
you know, sort of that first physical climate change impact and what it means beyond that. And, and you know, at the risk of maybe answering a follow, one of your later questions, Carolina, you know, when you look at the Mediterranean, there is, you know, warming is happening across the region. That's, that's a given. Uh, how much it's increasing is going to obviously depend on what ends up happening. You know, emissions will play a role in that. When we look at the Mediterranean as, as one of those regions, the coastal Mediterranean, um, there's going to be this further aridity coupled with sea level rise, right? And so uh, the aridity component is sort of adding an acceleration to fire weather conditions. So all these wildfires that we saw in, in North Africa in, in the Levant region, there is gonna be a propensity for that to increase in the future as well. You think of sea level rise coupled with that, um, first place I think of is, is the Nile River Delta, right? Very fertile region, a lot of agricultural activity, certainly other parts of the med coastal Mediterranean. So that very important aspect of the economy, the agricultural production is at risk because of sea level rise, sort of that intrusion of, of water slowly through time, <clears throat> but also this higher incidence of wildfires. So there's now a, an economic component. You look further inland in North Africa, <clears throat> not necessarily at the coastal, kind of extending down towards the Sahel, the aridification, the drought issues uh, sort of extend, but at the same time, there is going to be higher incidence of short but intense duration type thunderstorms. And, and the first place I think of is the Nile River Basin. We've been hearing about the flooding issues that have been happening in Sudan uh, and certainly parts of Ethiopia. That could happen more often, you know, unless, and it's not to go into the Nile system, that's another, you know, uh, issue of its own, but without sort of almost perfect coordination and conjunctive management of the reservoirs, higher intensity duration, high, short and short duration, higher intensity thunderstorms, you're going to have more flooding and with reservoirs sort of managing for a drought, but then also uh, struggling with these storms coming in, it makes it very more difficult to manage a system that's already um, having difficulties in conjunctive management of, of operations of reservoirs. And then when we think of the Arabian Peninsula, and certainly uh, more so in Central Asia, sort of bleeding out from, from, the, from the Arabian Peninsula, sort of Central and Middle East area, um, the warming for systems that tend to be snow-driven uh, and I think more towards shifting towards Central Asia, the, uh, the Amu Darya system, uh, those that are tend to be driven by higher elevation runoff, uh, primarily through snowpack, there's going to be less snow being retained and more snow melt. Ultimately, that causes a shift in, in the runoff season uh, that, you know, usually the, the snow accumulation season in the winter, you have a runoff season in the spring leading into summer, you're seeing a reduction of that flow, but also a shift of that. And so that affects management of those types of river systems uh, uh, downstream and you know tiger euphrates to a smaller extent as well and then touching on a point i think nishad made as well on extreme weather um, the arabian sea is in very close proximity to the equator and so when you think of solar radiation there's there's more uh more solar energy being absorbed by the ocean sea surface temperatures increase when sea surface temperatures increase the warmer they get those are ripe conditions to uh uh, to produce and provide energy for intense, uh, uh, severe weather and storms. You know, at, at, at the lower end of severe, the type of thunderstorms that cause, you know, intense uh, uh, precipitation, some amount of flooding, uh, certainly, you know, areas like Oman that have actual um, mountainous topography to an extent that will cause types of flush, uh, flash flooding in valleys. But at the more worrisome end, and we've seen it this year uh, with Cyclone Shaheen, there is more uh, a more uh, probability of those types of uh, cyclonic, severe, intense uh, uh, storms to actually emerge out of the Arabian Sea and make landfall. I mean, the Arabian Sea is, like I said, because it's proximity to the equator, is naturally warmer. So those types of storms of varying scales are always being produced uh, on the Arabian Sea. About half of them don't make landfall. They, they generate in the, in, over the sea and they, and they just dissipate over the sea. Uh, and some, uh, some smaller amount make landfall, but at a reduced uh, intensity. What we're likely going to see, unfortunately, is some of those higher uh, uh, intensity cyclones make landfall and make landfall <clears throat> at that higher, higher intensity scale. And so that obviously comes with it. Uh, you know, the damages and, and unfortunate loss of life and, and those types of things. So that's 
you know, grim news, but that's, that's what is being projected in the future. Thank you so much. And not to get into more grim news, but who or what are some of the most vulnerable groups being affected and impacted by climate change in the MENA region right now? And would, what is being done to address the disproportionate impacts on these vulnerable groups? And if you'd like to start, Mohammed, um, this one, and we could go back around the other way. I like how the hard one is the one I get to answer first. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this broadly and, and, then, and then maybe my panelists will, will dive a little bit deeper. You know, I think generally in terms of preparation for, for these types of events, in, in terms of whether uh, putting policies or initiatives into action or actual projects or infrastructure that helps to mitigate some of these uh, impacts, Generally speaking, I think nations that um, don't have as much financial capabilities or resources uh, or access to um, personnel uh, or, or technologies to, to start putting some of these actions into play, I think are gonna generally be, be most vulnerable. Um, if just if looking at it in terms of response, right? I think the region as a whole is vulnerable because of all these very uh, impacts that are going to happen because of warming and you know geography changes some of those impacts to, to some of those different subregions. But I think in terms of response, um, certainly capacity to respond is would be a little bit more difficult, a uh, challenge uh, for, for nations that don't necessarily have those resources uh, ready to put into action. So I'll let others dive a little bit deeper. Thank you so much. And we can go to you, Nishad, um, next, and then to Karim. Well, like, um, I'll just take from where Mohammed stopped, like, um, it is disproportionate because some of the countries are well wealthy or economically stable and better infrastructure in place, uh, make it easier for them to at least to uh, buy some time, to be frank. Uh, example, if you would take from the Gulf countries point of view, uh, agriculture is not a main source of income. Revenues are from X, Y, Z, you know it. Uh, so, most of the uh, farmlands are already not been very fertile. Most of the uh, cultivations are mostly into hydroponics or uh, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, systems where they develop a lot of farming system as such, uh, which is uh, extensive and requires a lot of uh, uh, finance and subsidies by the government to do that. But you go towards uh, from this Gulf towards Maghrib or Mashri countries, uh, uh, farming and agriculture is the, the most uh, economic and most job oriented areas for the much of the families who live in those parts of the world. And this sort of changes in sudden weather or the, the changing weather, uh, both affecting on the temperature and on the water scarcity makes it um, absolutely uh, disastrous for the, the seasons. So it causes them to have failed crop seasons or drought for, uh, forces them to uh, you know, go away from farming and they migrate towards the cities and that puts more burden on the cities for finding more jobs. And this creates uh, a lot of vacuum for young people, especially uh, given the fact that it has been not very well studied or documented, but you know, young people are moving, moving towards radicalization because they don't find better job opportunities. Uh, and this creates a lot of uh, issues within the region. It has been going through a lot of uh, civil wars and et cetera. So as, as looking from the perspective of how uh, disapproval impact would be different for like I mentioned with the regional wise, uh, looking um, further, this is going to be intense and uh, and making sure also understanding the fact that um, the 70% or 60% of the, uh, the region's, um, region's population are young people. And if you don't really find a real solution to providing them better infrastructure and jobs in the coming years, uh, it would be extremely difficult for the government to cope up with the pressure. Uh, already this region has been seen appraising and you know fight against for you know independence and democracy as such. As we already have something to do with uh, the existing climate or environment system uh, making or sparking that uh, that issues to be starting. So the like I mentioned, like uh, Mohammed mentioned too, the the the, the fact is that uh, some of the country who are more economically uh, stable, they may find some buy some time over the course of time, but rest would be really already suffering. I mean, I don't have to say they're going to, but they're already suffering. And the only thing is um, the intensity is going to be more severe in the coming days. Thank you so much. And we'll go to Karim for some closing remarks on this question. Can I complain that I get to go last and I don't? And they already said everything. Well, there is one thing to say that um, uh, obviously, obviously, it's the it's the the less well-off countries, so the the Levant and North Africa that will struggle. And the, in my view, within those countries, as Hamid has pointed out, 
Um, within those countries, though, the sectors that will be most likely to be affected will be agriculture and tourism. Um, the, the, the fact that the weather is going to be less inviting will mean that there's going to be less tourists, and the fact that the temperature will change, the uh, rainfall will be less, aridity will increase, or the, se the, the agricultural season, the growing season will shift. All of these reasons mean that they will get less agriculture productivity, so less livelihoods. So people who work in agriculture might lose their livelihoods. And as a result, we'll have to move to cities which are already struggling with unemployment. So the, the youth unemployment issue will just get worse. So if you are looking for a group that will struggle most, I would say it's the youth of the Middle East, the North Africans, uh, sorry, the, 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 the Levant and North Africans um, uh, cities. And I, I would say that would uh, only get worse uh, in the coming years as a, as a result of these uh, primary impacts. And then there's the other issue, which is another uh, group uh, the refugees and the displaced. The region is home to many, most of the world's displaced people are in the region. Uh, a lot of them are in Turkey, a lot of them in Syria, internally displaced, some of them in Lebanon, in Jordan. And those, those people are highly vulnerable because the lack, the access to water is limited to start with. So a, a scarcity of the resource caused by climate change could only exacerbate their, their, their suffering really. Um, and, and, and in my mind, also, the, the, any resource conflict that could emerge in the region would, would make this worse both, both for both groups. Um, and and I, I worry about that scenario, but we have no certainty about that uh, happening at all. But that's my two cents on the subject. Thank you so much. Um, and getting to one of the questions that's already been submitted into the Q&A and going off of that, um, Ian asks, will the impacts of, the, of climate change on water scarcity interplay with the situation along the Nile with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance, Renaissance Dam? If so, how? And then, so we can start with you, Dr. Mohammed, um, because I know you specialize in water scarcity, but then to go broader from that as well, in what way, other ways do you see the impacts of climate change impacting conflict in the region as a whole? Yeah, uh, you know, we, we can use the Nile as an example, but I think what, I, what I'll say is relevant to other similar, you know, multi-nation transboundary river systems. Certainly, Tigris Euphrates now, you know, just touching on what Kareem said, some of, you know, some of the vulnerable populations that rely on those systems. Um, the issue, and, and we're seeing on the Nile, we're seeing it now in the news with what's happening with the drought in Syria, which is really just an extension of, of the drought affecting the Tigris uh, uh, River system in general, is with drought, uh, what ideally would be a collaborative system. I mean, there, there is a path forward for nations that share a, a river system that have multiple reservoirs on it, um, where they could maximize their benefits if there is coordinated operation amongst those reservoirs. Because part of the issue is um, for some of those reservoirs, you're trying to maximize water supply, water storage, as well as water release, and then connection with water release if, it's a, if it has a hydropower component, which a significant amount of them do, uh, certainly the GERD is, uh, it's really more of a hydropower generating reservoir than it is storage uh, because of where it's placed in the system. It's, it's, pretty much right at the border between Sudan and Ethiopia. So it doesn't benefit Ethiopia to store water there because releasing it doesn't benefit uh, their population. But there has to be, even in the best conditions where we're not under drought, these systems are not under drought, coordinate operation between nations helps to maximize water releases downstream because there's competing demands, right? You think of Egypt at the end of that system, huge agricultural component in Egypt. So they're very much, uh, reliant on a particular amount of supply moving downstream. And so the further you go upstream, there's more reservoirs and there's sort of different uh, priorities between the nations uh, and almost competing and certainly gets worse as drought persists. Um, what ends up being happening is maybe there's more storage being held upstream. There's changes to releases downstream that affects how water is used, certainly for agricultural production, right? There's different Different crops may grow on different part, preferably be grown and harvested in different times of the year. Each crop has different irrigation requirements. Um, all of these sort of complicating factors uh, almost make it difficult uh, as is, but without coordinated operation, it becomes even more difficult. So I think going to the specific question again, if you have a system that's already in drought, 
then sort of generalizing here, the, the reservoirs are tend to be operated more to maximize storage, right? So you're releasing water downstream, but sort of the more optimizing rule is to maximize your storage as you're trying to release water downstream to meet either downstream demand or maximize hydropower. As you're doing that, what ends up happening is when you have these short type of intense thunderstorms in the Nile, so you know as it's been happening in the Nile, um, not so much in the Euphrates, um, in a system that may be already being operated um, sort of bare thin, that's when you tend to have these flooding events uh, because they're not anticipated and they're already overlaying over a system that's operating under drought versus operating under wet conditions. Because if you're operating under wet conditions, uh, you know, you operate your reservoirs differently in terms of how much you store and how much is released. But when you're operating on drought, uh, it almost goes counter counterintuitive to how you would operate it under, under wet conditions. So that's why these flooding things happen. And then if you look at the Euphrates, you're seeing some of the secondary effects where there's less water being released, Turkey downstream to Syria and downstream uh, to Iraq. And you're seeing why the, the drought issue in Syria and in, uh, in, uh, in the northern part of Syria is, is getting attention because um, there's less water available, water isn't being used for agriculture, cost of crops and, and, and agricultural production uh, goes up. Uh, populations are already struggling, as was mentioned previously. Um, so access to food becomes difficult, access to water becomes difficult. You see people going to the actual river system and taking water directly themselves. It's not treated, they're getting sick. Uh, and then, because their only alternative at this point is to use bottled water or water tankers that are coming into their communities and that water is highly inflated in terms of cost. So there's, second, there's certainly secondary and, and third effects because of that, but, um, but it's, it, it makes it very difficult to manage those reservoirs. And then you have sort of this uh, almost uh, winners versus losers type of, of, of operation of the system. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna change the question a little bit um, and go to Nishad on this one to start. But what countries in the MENA region are emerging as leaders in addressing the climate crisis right now? And specifically thinking about um, Saudi Arabia and the Green Initiative, how will politics and leadership be willing to follow Saudi Arabia's leadership on this initiative? Well, I mean, um... Of course, the politics in the region will definitely define uh, how this would, um, uh, how the cooperative way they would move forward. Uh, given there's the Gulf countries, as um, uh, as you know, there is a council called GCC, the, uh, the Gulf Governing Council. Uh, if they stick into working together, there's a lot of opportunity as such. But the leadership of Saudi Arabia coming up with the Middle East um, objective was, uh, uh, I would say, some sort of uh, iconic because uh, it was not just the Gulf here. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman was looking at, he was looking at the regional assets, MENA region, and he was looking at uh, bringing billions of money. Of course, it was not just an announcement of um, making the region greener, uh, but with a lot of challenges and a lot of challenging cushions to also be asked. But um, of course, it comes at a time uh, when the region was going um, uh, more unfriendly to more friendly uh, direction. Uh, if you might have uh, recalled the blockade of Qatar by the regional uh, partners or regional countries, was something um, made an opening eyes that uh, this region is never shy of um, you know, politics. And uh, uh, it, it gave up an opportunity that you have to look at uh, your own back because you never know your friends and your enemies the next day. So um, that has been sidelined. Now you will see the President Mohammed bin Salman is touring the, all the Gulf countries recently. He was stopping over in Doha, Oman, and he was in UAE going to Kuwait. So probably this is sort of, you know, relationship building as um, uh, better for the region as such. And one of the discussion topics is, was environment and climate. That's what I heard uh, from his discussion with uh, Amir here in Qatar. So I would uh, presume it's a theme uh, on trade and environment are also on top priority discussion on his uh, a short trip to the region. And beyond uh, UAE is also another regional leader uh, who has been hosting the first regional Middle East summit uh, in um, Abu Dhabi uh, uh, during the, just ahead of COP, I think it was in October. Or, um, uh, early October, July, I guess, uh, with the support, uh, with the presence of COP president and also um, a U.S. A special envoy for climate change, uh, John Kerry was also there. Also some great announcement, a new coalition was formed um, within the countries in the region as such. 
So looking forward, the region uh, would, would do great. I mean, the, the net zero um, uh, uh, pathways from the region, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, all coming up with uh, uh, very, uh, for me, very fancy net zero commitments. Uh, let's see how, how well that are gonna be materialized in the days to come would be a, a big challenge. And also at the same time, uh, nothing is without any challenge if you want to you know, take a very unnecessary actions against climate change as such in reducing your emissions. So moving forward, uh, we would see how the commitments are materialized uh, within the NDCs, which are also submitted by the regional countries. Uh, Qatar had 25% um, reduction uh, um, in the business as usual scenario. And we would love to see um, how they're gonna announce. Uh, and just I heard from yesterday, ministry is looking at uh, nuclear power here in the Qatar after UAE. So things have been moving in a fast phase. They're looking nuclear as an option, uh, moving away from oil and gas. So. Uh, that's something UAE also has in their energy mix. I think Qatar is also looking at something to take things faster. So, well, in terms of reducing their emissions, uh, for of course for the um, uh, local consumption, they are very much, uh, uh, very much working hard to reduce through um, carbon capture or um, um, less flaring. All these are main targets for them to reduce their emission. Um, of course, uh, like I mentioned. Um, the, the emission reductions are more on consumption or local base, not on the international, uh, whatever they have been you know, trading to the global market is not considered into that, I believe. So it is a challenge at the same time, it uh, needs collective effort. And given now the region is looking to prosper together as one, uh, like in the past, it uh, gives a good hope that they, they can work together. Thank you so much. And Karim, do you um, can you speak to some of the regional leaders as well, maybe some outside of the Gulf region, whether in North Africa or in the Levant region, who are some of the leaders that are taking climate change seriously and inspiring action? Uh, there's uh, plenty of good action going on in, in the region. Um, the conventional um, leaders have been uh, Morocco, which has uh, highly been praised by uh, uh, climate action tracker and other observers like that. Um, they've gone down a little bit, but the renewable energy project has been widely praised as being uh, quite progressive. And at one point was in line with Paris uh, with Paris goals, which is uh, high praise indeed. Um, others have, have made moves, albeit limited, including um, the renewable energy pushes that you'd see in Egypt, uh, although Egypt doesn't really push on decarbonization, but it has a successful renewable energy project that aims to get to 42% renewables by 2035, I believe. Um, Jordan is making good efforts on that front. Uh, Turkey is already producing half of its electricity from renewable energy. Um, and, and I think we've already alluded to the high aspirations uh, that we've seen from the UAE and from, and from Saudi Arabia in terms of full decarbonization. So I think that's the, that's the wider picture. It's rather patchy. Um, the the ways in which these have been measured are confusing to say the least. A lot of these NDCs don't have don't explain what the baseline scenario is, the business as usual scenario is. So it's hard to tell actually if that's a real reduction or just a slower growth uh, of carbon emissions. Um, but in some cases you can. But uh, overall, I think this would um, this would give you a picture on who's who's trying most. Thank you so much. And uh, one more question for Mohammed. This is an audience question. They were wondering how much of COP do you think will turn into action um, and what governments are supporting this? Um, I'm a little bit pessimistic, so maybe I'm, I'm not the best person to answer this question. Um, I think inevitably action will come. You know, my, my concern is, will it be too late? I mean, you could argue, it's too late for action as is, right? Um, one of the other other things, um, and not just to go back to the IPCC report, besides it saying that yes, you know, climate impacts of climate change are unarguably anthropogenically influenced. You know, human human activities behavior has been a driver of what we're seeing. But some of the impacts, even in the best case, absolute best case scenario of action and response, and primarily this is associated with, with emissions, right? Mitigation, actual mitigation efforts. Um, some impacts are not going to be reversible for hundreds of years. And, and, and uh, the one I think of uh, that's referenced is sea level rise. 
um, you know, at this point, sea level rise will continue unabated, even in, in the best case scenario, even if you slash emissions to absolute minimum, um, sea level rise will still persist uh, for, for at least a couple hundreds of years. Some other impacts um, in, in terms of warming can still be mitigated, but still that action won't be for decades as well. So, the, so even in the best case scenario, we won't really see a lot of these impacts uh, for most of our lifetimes, most of us in our lifetimes. Um, so, but that's not an excuse to, to kick that can down the road, um, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm trying to be hopeful in terms of, you know, what came out of the COP meeting with the Glasgow Pact and, and and you know, with the with the COP being in the middle in the MENA region, the next couple of years, um, that we see more action and with respect to mitigation, that was the focus in this COP. But I also, uh, I'm, I think I'm more realistically uh, expectant of uh, adaptation taking more of a forefront uh, because it's those are two pieces of the puzzle. Obviously, mitigation addresses climate change directly. Uh, but uh, adaptation is also uh, helpful uh, in terms of uh, dealing with some of the impacts. You know, one doesn't go uh, without the other. So, thank you so much. And that is all the time we have for questions. Would all of you like to make a short thirty-second to a minute closing statement? And we can start with Mohammed and then go to Karim and then Mishad to finish it off. Sure, I'll, I'll just pick up on the last thing I said in terms of adaptation mitigation and, and, and kind of how important both, you know, both of them are and adaptation getting more of a spotlight. Because the way, the best analogy I can describe it, I think resonates with people. If you think of climate change as a disease, right? Maybe this is too on the nose with, with the whole COVID pandemic, but mitigation, when you talk about reducing emissions, mitigation is like treating the disease directly, right? But adaptation, is like treating the symptoms, right? You're not necessarily treating the disease, you're finding ways to adapt and deal with the outcomes of climate change. Both are helpful. Ultimately, treating the disease is good, is, is the ultimate outcome, right? That's, that's why the talk is always focused on emissions. But um, until that happens, and as we're seeing, it's not gonna happen soon, you still want to deal with the symptoms, right? So that's why adaptation takes a larger role as we still try to deal uh, with the mitigation issues. So I think both, both are very important and just wanna, wanna leave people with that anecdote. Thank you so much. Uh, sure, um, it's hard to summarize after this panel, but um, I, would, I would say that the region has just has such a unique and, uh, and highly um, fragile uh, environment. And, and as a result, given its exposure to climate change and its social vulnerability to climate change, its overall climate risk is really high. Um, and, and so one, it's easy to despair and, and, and say, well, the region, ultimately people will have to move somewhere else, maybe move to more temperate climates if it gets really bad. And uh, all these challenges that you've listed, uh, that I have listed. Uh, so I, I, would, I, would, I would say that risk is really high, the risk of falling into that despair. Um, but th that future doesn't have to be that bad. So th there are ways in which the region can become more resilient, can become more adapted, can deal with some of these challenges. There are ways in which it can learn to live within its means and learn to live in more in harmony with its nature and find development solutions uh, that are not based on uh, Western models of urban development, for example, but they're based on local climate and local needs given the climate change as well. So the, the, the future climate of the region and, and innovation, can help. So there, we're not saying that we could find a silver bullet somewhere where this is going to be all great, but we're saying it can be less bad and it can, we can avoid the worst impact of climate change if we use human ingenuity and find ways in which we can navigate around this, both on the adaptation side and on the mitigation side. And I will close with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mishad? Well, uh, uh, same, uh, you'll give me a last word. I have nothing much to add on to uh, what Mohammed and Karim uh, did up. So just to uh, wind up with an youth perspective, uh, given the region is uh, when it be, will be affected differentially, uh, young people will be looking after having uh, more green jobs, um, uh, industries uh, booming up in sectors like Kari mentioned, innovation and science uh, is something that the region have to look after. And of course, use the enormous wealth or sovereign wealth they have in many of the oil and gas rich countries to fund those programs. 
uh, that would be great uh, way forward for uh, young people to see that they have a better or prosperous future here as such. And also coming uh, forward to how the COP26 and 7 looks like, given the region has a close proximity with um, uh, least developed countries, unlike the global north, this region has been very close proximity working with LDC countries. And um, this would uh, see, uh, like uh, Mohammed mentioned, a lot of discussion on loss and damage, which got up space at COP26, and the funding you know, was vetoed by US and other Western interests. So this will gain more traction in, um, in the Sharm el Sheikh, the Egypt the summit happening the next year. And that is was asked by most of the LDC countries and uh, what you call the small oceanic island countries as such, SIDS, what you call SIDS countries and also LDC countries. Uh, they would love coming to Egypt because they know they have a support from the region as such to something like you take over the, the US and the, the, you know, the historical emitters to, you know, how, how, how you can collectively work on. And the, given the region has been quite profoundly supporting financially outside the, not the main climate fund which they're asking for, but also from the state budgets have been sent to these least developing countries as such. And also the least uh, LDC is hosting a summit here in Doha, which is the LDC conference next in January. Uh, and climate is one of the main agenda and how the, how it can be enhanced, how they can be helped supporting to provide them technology transfer, financial support, et cetera. So COP27, I mean, all COPs has been used the same way, gonna save the world, but it is not going to save the world, but at least you know, pave some path towards that. So I think um, uh, the COP27 will be critical for the LDC countries as such, if they require the real support. Um, a lot of good um, uh, opening ups happen at COP26, uh, other than some face out and face down comments at the end of the day, but uh, some real pictures have been opened up, but it needs more concrete steps will probably take place in Egypt and in Abu Dhabi in the coming years. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit optimistic. Uh, at the same time, uh, things are not improving at, at also. So COP is just a you know, place to discuss, but uh, things happen all across the year. So hopefully they sit uh, ahead of time to make sure they are in line before we end up at Marrakesh or, uh, sorry, we end up in, um, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh or in Abu Dhabi. So like, optimistically looking forward and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, especially Nishad, where I know it's past 11 p.m. in Qatar right now. But I would like to, again, to thank our panelists for taking the time to speak with us and for our audience members and students for participating in the event. Um, we are just so grateful for everyone. Wishing students a great finals week coming up. And thank you all and hope you have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.